53 and a half. Perk, are you taking, or actually they're listed at 53 and a half. Are you taking over, under on the Bucks, 53 and a half? Well, George, this is what I call the dead boat lock, and I'm taking the over. Look, one thing I would never do again in life is doubt Giannis Antetokounmpo, okay? Because he is never satisfied. And then you bring it back Middleton, along with Drew Holiday. I love the addition of Grace, uh, Grayson Allen, along with along with Bobby Portis, okay? Bobby Portis is going to play a, 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 a more significant role. I see the Bucks having 60 wins easy. I'm taking the over. Ooh, Perk, you're right about Giannis. He's never satisfied, but I think that there's going to be just a little bit more coasting here, oh. and teams are going to be gunning for this squad to assert themselves. So I'm taking the under, but barely, like at 53 flat. Nah, I'm with Perk here, Monica. I mean, the, Giannis does not know how to take his foot off the gas. Like, And, and honestly, neither does Mike Boonholzer, really, in a lot of ways. Um, I know people joke about all oh, the minutes or whatever during the regular season, and he plays him a certain amount. That's because Giannis and Chris Middleton and those guys are going at it for the first three and a half quarters against whoever they're playing. So I, I'm going to be with Perk. I'm going to go over on this particular one. But next, we have the Lakers. Here in Los Angeles, where I'm at, whose win total is listed hey. at 51 and a half. And Perk's dog already upset that we, uh, we're we talking about the Lakers. Was that Monica's dog? dog? How many dogs we have on this show? She doesn't have that. Right. We have a lot, George, we have a lot of dogs, and they all are disagreeing with, uh, with their owners at the time. Like Monica Dog was mad at her for taking the books on, on the under, and rightfully so. Monica, what's your dog name? Hoops, and listen, I, you got her, her name is Hoops. Okay. Uh, well, well, Hoops had a problem with you, and, yeah. and rightfully so. Yeah. Ho Hoops felt that Giannis was going to go remember over. who feeds her. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> All right, so over, on a, over under, Bonica, 51 and a half on the Lakers. <laughs> All right, I really wanted to, like, push this one, because I just, I just, I'm going to go over, but not by a lot. Okay. What? Look, this is another dead boat lock. You cannot tell me that you're about to have LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, Carmelo Anthony, Ray John Rondo, Dwight Howard, Trevor Ariza, all of these players, and you're telling me that they're not going to have a 60-win season? Please. Matter of fact, Kurt, I wouldn't be surprised Kurt. if they wouldn't press the surface of hitting a 70-win season. Oh, Perk, now you're getting crazy. Come on. Just look Kirk. at Perk. I mean, look at this lineup. Perk. Look at this lineup. Listen, and you got to tell me, just tell me the last time that in this lineup, all these guys played an entire season. I, I Listen, oh. do, is this going to be a playoff team? 100%. But 70 wins? Listen now, I know we're supposed to be I, professional I said, on TV, but Perk, now listen, you bugging. I'm bugging. I'm bugging with six, with six future Hall of Famers. And look. You have two of them that has chips on their shoulder. One thing I know, okay? One thing I know, it's almost mm -hmm. like fighting Floyd Mayweather. This is how the Lakers are going to be every single night. Just the build-up, the intensity of playing the Lakers, the crowd, the atmosphere. Those younger teams that are out there, they're not going to be ready for that. So the Lakers are ready. You remember? You remember that language you came up with today? You did not answer the factual language of when was the last time that all those guys you mentioned I, played an entire season. I told, I just told you before we came on camera to fix your body language. I just told you that. <laughs> See, I, <laughs> Mr. Park, well, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, well, listen, here's what I'll say. I'll split the difference a little bit here, okay? Well, listen, I, I agree okay. it's over. I, I agree. I think we all agree. Let's start there. We all agree it's over, whether it's a little over or a yes. lot over. We all agree it's over. Now, I think, Monica, a little over is too low because I look at 51. I'm like, LeBron James coming off all this rest, okay, and, and, and with a chip on his shoulder, like Perk said, we saw what happened the last time that happened. They want a chip in Los Angeles with him in that similar situation. Now, Perk, 70 wins, you've lost your damn mind, okay? <laughs> 70 wins is crazy. Thank you. But, 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 George, but, George, listen, I didn't say they were, I said they could be knocking at the door. That means they could have 65 wins. Would y'all okay. be surprised if they have a 65 That's kind of far from season? the door, I think, 65 from would, 70. Would y'all be surprised I would be surprised if they have a 65. I would be. I would be, because to your point about the Bucks. 
Yeah. I would be surprised, Perk, because to your point about the Bucks, we know that Giannis doesn't take his foot off the gas. So I could be flat out wrong on that one. On this one, this is a team of veterans who know exactly how to push the speed limit, pull back, push the brake. So I would be very surprised if they win 65 games. Uh, yes. well, the fascinating part about all of this is we all agree, but yet we don't yep. agree, okay? That's the great part of this particular <laughs> conversation. All right, lastly, we got the Miami Heat. Perk, Caesars list their win total at 47. They added Kyle Lowry. I know you talk about them boys from Dade County. You have another nickname for them that I'll let you say. Are you going over or under on the Miami Heat? Oh, I'm going under, but slight under. Like, I think it's going to be a 45 win season. I think the only two things in the Eastern Conference that are going to win over 48 games is the Nets and the Milwaukee Bucks. So I'm going with the under just because I think they're going to win about 45 games. Wow, Perk, this was the one that I was probably most confident in and them going over. I got them getting to at least 50 because of the lore of Heat culture. And I think the two guys that they added in the offseason and Tucker and Lowry, they bring you championship pedigree. And I'm certainly sure that they want to bounce back after last season. Yeah, listen, I'm with Monica here, Perk. Perk, you're going to lose your 305 card, man, after you were talking about Fabuloso <laughs> and the cleaning products down in Dade County. All right, they're going to they're going to revoke your Miami privileges. Yeah, 40, nope. 47 wins, Perk. That's over on that. As Monica said, you bring in a Kyle Lowry. He talked about it this week, how he is hungry. He picked Miami because because their culture is about winning championships, and that's what he wants to do. I think everybody's sleeping on Miami. I think Tyler Hero will have a bounce-back season. You see him in the gym the other day? He swole all of a sudden. He better be careful. He may get tested like, De like De'Aaron Fox did the other day. Well, well, hold on, hold on, George and Monica. Don't don't get too hostile with me. I didn't say that they wasn't going to be a top five team in the Eastern Conference. I'm just looking at the teams in the Eastern Conference alone, and they have a lot of competition. They have the Bucks, they have Philly, they have the Nets. Chicago got better. The Knicks, the Hawks, the Celtics. All I'm saying is, I still have them a top five team. In the, in the Eastern Conference, I'm never going to go against them goons from Dade County and their exposure. And look, if they win 45 games, that's still a hell of a season. Not in Miami, man. Listen, You're right. Not in Miami. 45 wins, Pat Riley's yeah. trading people, if that's, if that's the target <laughs> that they're on. <laughs> Let's be real here. All right. Coming up next, 2018 number one. Russ was training and packed it on his trainers here. <laughs> then, he, he, then he let him know about it, as you see here. So, Perk, remember <laughs> when he yelled at some baby in the bubble or whatever? Is there anyone he hasn't yelled at? Nah, Russ is going to yell at anybody that's yeah. not on his team. He don't care the age or whatever. He'll yell at your grandmother. The fact of the matter is this. Why are the trainers wearing pads? That's how dangerous Russell Westbrook is, even when he's working out. Good point. I mean, they also got like Nerf bats or something. Yeah. <laughs> I think those are like UCLA students or something. <laughs> he's yamming it on them though, for sure. Like umpires out there with those padding there. <laughs> Next, Miss Answers. The captain, Derek Jeter, delivered his Hall of Fame induction speech yesterday. Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing showed up to support him. So, Ramona, who's a good NBA comp for Jeets? Okay. The only thing that popped into my mind was Tim Duncan because mm. the longevity with one franchise, all of the winning. But I don't know what kind of gift bags uh, Tim Duncan was. I mean, oh, look, no gift Derek baskets. Is, like, is he a, <laughs> Tim Duncan's probably as beloved in San Antonio as Jeets was in New York, but like different market. I don't know. Derek Jeter is one of a kind. Yeah, I second, I second that. <laughs> Stand with one franchise. Winning multiple championships and World Series. I have to say, Tim Duncan is well, Ramona. You were on point like Rondo with that one. See, I, I would have gone with Kobe. Like, I, I thought, you know, Kobe when I thought Derek Jeter. Just, you know, young, one franchise, you know, came through. Like, I don't know. Yeah, but never made LA, a second day story. Jeets made no second day story. Right. Kobe right. did. Next, make progress. <laughs> the up and coming Hornets hosted an open run. Perk, what does the next step look like for this Charlotte squad? And why weren't you at that open run? Well, well, first, I can't I run no more. That's the first thing, yeah. George. But second of all, <laughs> look, this team right here is going to be a threat to make the playoffs in the Eastern Conference. And what you have is you have a bunch of young guys that love the game of basketball. These guys just want to hoop from Balls, from Oubre to Rozier. These guys want to play the game of basketball. They love it. 
This is a beautiful thing to see. This is how you develop camaraderie before training camp. Camaraderie, culture, and I think the biggest thing for them is just staying healthy. LaMelo needs yeah. to stay healthy this year. Yeah, if they do that, they'll make the playoffs, I think, in the Eastern Conference. I, I, I agree. And shout out to James Borrego, right? Yeah. And Mitch Kupchak. Everyone left Mitch Kupchak for dead, right, after the Lakers. Yeah. And, and look what they've been able to accomplish there. Uh, in Charlotte so far, and we'll see what their future looks like. Speaking of the future, the future of Dame time with the Blazers seemed murky this summer, but Dame posted this on Instagram on Wednesday, quote, back for more. Hashtag Rip City is my city. This offseason, the Blazers re-signed Norman Powell, added Larry Nance, and Cody Zeller, but lost Carmelo Anthony, Zach Collins, and Ennis Cantor. Plus, they enter the year with a new coach in our friend Chauncey Billups. So, Perk, have the Blazers done enough to make Dame happy here? You know what? I wouldn't use the word happy, but I would use the word satisfied. And I think he's going to give it a shot. And I think one reason is because of big shot, Chauncey Billups. When you think about what Chauncey Billups done throughout his NBA career is what Dane Dollar is trying to accomplish. Win the championship, win finals MVP. Both of them played the point guard position. And Chauncey was one of, was on one of the greatest, if not the greatest defensive team of all time in NBA history. And so he's going to bring that to the Portland Trailblazers. We all know that Portland could score with the best of them, but when it came down to the defensive side of things, they were all moving like they had two left feet. I think Larry Nance Jr. is going to be really good for them in that, in that role. That was a, a sneaky good pickup there. But it, have they done enough to appease it? No, we're just going to see how they play. Um, when, when he goes and, and gets out there in the first month or two of the season, everybody's going to be watching to see how this Portland Trailblazers roster comes together. And if they, if they get off to a good start, I think it's going to go a long way in keeping him happy and giving them the rest of the season to, to convince him to, to want to stay there. Um, I think we, start, we started off the show talking about Ben Simmons and him not wanting to show up to camp. This situation with Dame easily could have gone in that direction. And, and even more so because as legitimate reasons to want to go someplace, I think Dame probably has a better reason than Ben Simmons because this is more on the franchise than on him. But, but Dame just got married over the weekend. He's in a good mood. He's doing the wedding hashtag for himself, doing it with the, with the city. I think that's a good sign. He's going to start camp in a good place, in a good mood. It's not going to be a, it will be a distraction for the Trailblazers, but if they play well, if they start winning, I think this goes, I think he stays there. Yeah, I just think the West is so hard and so deep. And and look, defensively, that's been a big issue for them. And hopefully, as Perk mentioned, right, like that's where Chauncey uh, puts his stamp on top of just obviously helping Dame mm -hmm. along, right? Like, look, that Detroit Pistons team that you mentioned, Perk, yeah, they were a great defensive team, um, but they were kind of uh, an underdog in a lot of ways when they won that championship. Can he get that out of this group and say, hey, we may not be the favorite in the West, but I've been on a team that wasn't the favorite, and look what we ended up doing so well that defensive effort starts with dame then i mean if you're the okay. leader of the team and you need to improve the defense it's got to start with dame and cj you agree perk well, well well one thing i can say is when we watch dame in the olympics i watch dame fighting to get up over screens yep. because greg popovich was holding him accountable so when i look at just the makeup of this look we got to remember this team was in the western conference finals just two years ago so, or three years ago, I'm sorry. So when I'm looking at Dame Lillard, yes, it started from the head of Snape. You look at what C.J. McCullough has been doing throughout this summer, posting his off-season workouts, putting in the work. Nurkic, like everybody, everybody has been down on Nurkic, including myself. But it was a point of time where Nurkic was filling up the stat sheet where he was actually doing his job. So now when you have a guy that played at the highest level, and we witnessed this with the Atlanta Hawks and the Phoenix Suns, and who knows? We don't know what could happen. Again, they had the injuries happen throughout this postseason. A little luck, and the Trailblazers could be right in the thick of things. All right, Perk, we'll see. Momo, thank you for hanging out today. We'll see you soon. <laughs> All right, Reggie. There she is. Right. Well, look, a lot of what 2K does is to make the real world come to life. And with all the, you know, back and forth rivalry that Kendrick and I have had, it just seemed perfect to put it in the game and have some fun with it. Uh, it, which is why Kendrick was great to have on set and just killed it with his role in 2K, which I can't wait for people to see. Now, how did the actual beef come about though? I'm curious about that. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 oh, go ahead. 
No, it, it really wasn't. It really wasn't that bad. I was just a little upset about my rate <laughs> on NBA 2K with the Celtics. So I said, you know what? Look, I'm about to watch this celebrity game during All Star Weekend, and I'm about to give Ronnie a, a rating. And you know what? Ronnie really wasn't that bad. But because I was so emotional and caught up in my feelings, I had to give him the business. Well, but Ronnie, Ronnie. I, I wasn't that bad. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I wasn't that bad. I had 10 points in the first quarter. I had as many points as the MVP common in that game. Uh, I got I got iced out by Quavo for the rest of the game. That's what happened. Go watch, go watch your tape again, uh, Perk, and then give me a roll right <laughs> now. Ronnie, do you do you remember do you remember the rating you gave him that upset him? Do you remember it all or no? Uh, it was like somewhere yeah, was, in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was like a 60. And look, I was an NBA champion, George. I'm like, hold on, Ronnie, at least give a brother a 75. Everybody, everybody on the starting five had an 80 plus except for Big Perk. Perk, we're, we're lucky. Like, oh. We're lucky it's a team game, Perk. We're lucky it's a team game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, man. So, clearly, hey, George, listen, I will say this. I will say this. I enjoyed every minute of working with Ronnie when I was down there, you know, doing my part. I mean, everything about it, looking at it behind the scenes, watching how, how hard, how much work th those people behind the scenes put into actually making this game what it has become today. It was a beautiful thing to see and a beautiful thing to be a part of. So, Ronnie, clearly we've seen how uh, players get a little sensitive about their ratings. I've seen plenty of guys tweet you over the years. Um, how, does, how do the ratings come about? Uh, look, originally the ratings were a mechanism for our own players to have identities, right? Like, how do you separate a Michael Jordan from the rest of the players in the league? We have to assign ratings from them. Um, and, you know, over the years, it's become this kind of cultural phenomenon that bothers so many players. I mean, I, I don't know if the number so much bothers them, but where they rank against their peers, look, they're very competitive. It's another way for them to be competitive. So uh, that rating has meant so much to these players, and it's really taken a life of its own and meant so much to our franchise. Well, look, there's a number of cover athletes this year. Luca, obviously, Candace Parker is on the WNBA 25th anniversary edition. Uh, you also have Dirk, Kareem, and KD on the NBA 75th anniversary. How did you decide on those? I mean, Candace was a no-brainer. Uh, it was very important for us to celebrate um, her, the legacy of her career. That's obviously a GameStop mm -hmm. exclusive. Um, it is the 75th anniversary, so we needed to celebrate the transition of the game and all of the wonderful people that have played. Um, and those three guys represent them among uh, anyone. And then Luca, obviously, with the success he's had early in his career and what he means to the global you know, world of basketball, uh, he was an incredible partner. You know, we just did the 2K Foundations court in uh, his hometown of Slovenia. Um, and oh, to open up a court and give back to the game that he loved so much and, you know, is making his life now. Uh, was incredible to partner with him on. So he's been an incredible partner as well. Now, Ronnie, in April of last year, you guys had a 2K tournament that Devin Booker ended up winning. Uh, is there a potential for another tournament? Can we get Perk in there so you can clown him on his skills? <laughs> Uh, Perk, I can't wait to rate your actual 2K 2K skills. But no, um, that was a phenomenal thing, you know, uh, with the pan with the pandemic uh, coming about, and for us to find another way for these athletes to find their competitive juices and like put it, you know, put it out there, bring their personalities to life. That's not something that fans don't see every day to hear them talk trash. Uh, obviously, they talk trash on the courts, but uh, with those microphones and getting into that experience, it's something that a lot of the fans like felt relate relating to. So. Uh, to get those guys to do that. I would love to do it again. I think those uh, definitely something that the fans want to see. It's always about timeline, right? And I, yeah. I, I'm sure we're going to continue to build and uh, look forward to doing some more with that program. Hey, Ronnie, listen, besides yours truly being on there and having my talk show, top show daily, <laughs> what are you excited most about for us with the game releasing tomorrow and everything about it? Like, what should we expect? So this is our... 23rd title and you know perk uh having you represent us and having all of the elements of uh the basketball world represent us for these 23 years is it's quite incredible you know we're trying to be as authentic as possible and really connect with the fan and uh, you said it earlier and I, you stole the words out of my mouth our team you know uh, year over year 
has just created an incredible franchise that means so much to the fans and there's so much work that's put in by the visual concepts team uh to innovate and you know give the fans what they want year over year and it, it's been incredible i'm really excited about the my career mode obviously getting to interact with you getting to interact with myself uh people will get to do that there's a lot of uh NBA dignitaries that people are going to get to act, um, you know, act with, like Chris Brickley, the game. Um, so that's going to be really fun to see those scenes come out. But obviously, it starts with gameplay. Our gameplay is second to none, and it's going to be really fun to watch people just enjoy the offense-defense metagame that is basketball. Well, Ronnie, thank, mm. thank you so much for hanging out. NBA 2K22 yes, drops tonight <laughs> at midnight Eastern. Make mm -hmm. sure you get on that. Make sure you check out Pick Perk. Yeah, make sure you check out Perk and his, uh, his talk show at NBA 2K22. Ronnie, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you. My God, yeah, appreciate Ronnie. you. Perk, Big Perk, I'll see you soon. All right. All right. There you go. All right, coming. Welcome to The Jump. I'm George Sedano, and here's what we've got for you today. The Ben Simmons saga continues to evolve. If he holds out, could there be financial implications? Also, up in the Pacific Northwest, have the Blazers done enough this offseason to keep Damian Lillard happy? It's also time for some NBA win totals. Will the defending champs win over 53 and a half games this season? And lastly, Ronnie 2K joins us ahead of the launch of NBA 2K22. So put down the sticks, because The Jump starts now. Hey, what's up? Welcome to The Jump. I'm joined today by NBA champ Kendrick Perkins and our Perk. senior writer Ramona Shelburne here in studio with me. We'll have more guests joining us here throughout the show, but let's begin with the Ben Simmons saga. Our Tim Bontemps and Bobby Marks wrote an article today on ESPN.com that summarizes where Simmons and the Sixers are at this point. It has some interesting financial details, including the caveat about how Simmons' contract is paid out. There's a huge chunk of that money scheduled due on October 1st. So Ramona, can you take us through the details here? Well, there's two dates you need to know, okay? September 28th is when camp starts. If Ben Simmons doesn't show up to camp, that's when his clock starts. October 1st, that's when the Sixers have to make a decision. That is when 25% of Ben Simmons' salary is due. That's $8.2 million, okay? That is when the first 25% is due for him. And so, you know, that is when they need to decide, are we actually going to withhold that? Or are we going to, are we going to withhold that? Or are we going to pay him and keep him being paid even if he doesn't show up? Uh, a couple of teams I talked to said that they're, they, would be, they wouldn't be surprised if the Sixers went that route as well. So it's a big decision for both sides. All right, Perk, I'm going to ask you straight up. $8 million, that's a lot of coin. Would you give up $8 million? Well, well let me say this. It's roughly 6,500 languages around the world, okay? <laughs> and I just asked one today. And you know what that language is? It's called facts. And here are the facts <laughs> right here. Hell no, I would not give up eight point whatever it is, million dollars. Here's what I always tell the young guys and tell guys in the NBA. Get your money. Get all the letters that you possibly can. Leave nothing on the table and give nothing back. At the end of the day, this is a job. I know it's entertainment to others, but the, the, the big priority is to get your dollars because the, it doesn't last long. And on top of that, right, be a true professional. All right, at this point last year, we were dealing with a similar situation with James Harden, and we were crucifying James Harden for not showing up to camp. And when he did show up to camp, not wanting to be there and the distraction that he's caused. So we have to keep the same energy with Ben Simmons. I know he wants out, but at the end of the day, you're getting paid a lot of money to do your job. And by the way, nobody made Ben play bad. Doc Rivers kept Ben Simmons in the game last year when he should have took him out. This is on Ben Simmons. He has to be mentally tough. They booed Kobe. Brian when he went back to Philly. They booed Santa Claus when he was in Philly at one point in time. That's just what Philly is, but you have to get through it. But no, I'm not leaving $8 million on the table. So it's, don't think of it as leaving it on the table. Think of it as not going into your pocket right now. Mm. More like a deferred payment because Ben Simmons can not show up to camp. The Sixers can decide not to pay him. But if he gets traded later in the year, he can get that money back. They could pay him <laughs> later in the year if they work it out. And and it's a it's a gambit, right? How long can you not get paid? 
I don't know how good his accountant is. I don't know how well he's saved. He seems to have nice things, but he's made a lot of money in his career. And so if you really do want to be traded and you are willing to withhold, to go without a paycheck, this is your best way to force that issue. It is about leverage here, Perk. And right now, Ben Simmons' best leverage is to make things very uncomfortable on the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, if the Sixers decide, well, you know what? If he doesn't show up, we're going to pay him, keep things nice, because maybe we can talk him back into coming back to the team eventually. They could do that and keep things and keep things nice. But what happens if you start like four and six? What well, happens if you start three and seven? Now you're paying a guy not to work for a team that should be a lot better. It, it sounds like Perk's dog is not happy with the eight million not hitting hitting the direct deposit on time for anyone, let alone uh, you know Ben Simmons or even Perk. So Perk, what what, what do you make of that? Even if it's deferred, is that okay for you, or, or you just say no? He's still got to show up. Uh, I'm just I'm just talking about being a true professional, okay? Yeah. And I'm going to dive a little deeper, right? We at the point of, our, like, NBA guys are at the point of they, their careers while, where the NBA has gotten to, where guys are able to make $30, $40 million a year, right? So you had a generation of players like Larry Bird, Dominic Wilkins, Magic yep. Johnson. Those guys paved the way for guys like Ben Simmons to be getting paid top dollar. And what I'm saying is Ben Simmons has an obligation as well to make sure he does his part to make sure that he shows up to work so it don't affect the younger generation so that the NBA can continue to pay players $200 million. Because what's going to happen is the CBA is going to come up and owners are going to say, well, we remember what happened with James Harden. We also remember what happened with Ben Simmons. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be a clause. All of a sudden, it's going to be a, a Ben Simmons or a James Harden rule. And it's not fair to the upcoming basketball players that have dreams of making it to the NBA or that are going to make it to the NBA that they're not going to get the same opportunity to be blessed to make this type of money. That's, that's a great point, Perk. And I, and I think the, the larger issue here for Ben Simmons is the reason he don't want to go back to Philly is because it, he didn't play well. There, people said some things that uh, that upset him. And, but the issue with him shooting at the free throw line or three pointers, that's going to go with you wherever you get traded to. And well, so you can deal with it now or later. And the the Embiid part of this equation, where is that, Momo? As, as far as Joel Embiid's concerned, I mean, he said what he said. He put it on Twitter. He put it out there. Uh, he put it out for everyone to see. He's fine with Ben Simmons. He would be fine with him coming back. He Everyone appreciates Ben's talent. I think the issue for Ben is can he come back, show his face in Philly, withstand those boos that Perk is talking about? Everybody knows that's going to come. Is there anything he can say or do to ingratiate himself back with the Sixers? In his mind, it's no. He just wants a fresh start. But you have four years left on your deal. And as Perk says, if you don't show up, they don't have to pay you. But not paying him in, a, in some ways doesn't help their leverage in trading him. And so I think this will be an interesting debate within the Sixers front office and around the league of how Philly handles this if Ben Simmons really does not show up. Oh. What a game of chicken we've got here between Ben Simmons and the Philadelphia 76ers. It'll be fascinating to see how this all unfolds. Speaking of how it's going to unfold, Hall of Fame week. So it's time to run it back with our guy C-Webb. Chris Webber's top five plays, 1994. Check this out. Elevates for the snatch block right there on the Spurs. Oh. Come on now. The snatch block is so good. Understand. I mean, because you control the possession. You don't just swat it into the crowd. You control the possession and start the fast break. Led to a bucket. 2002. Dimes up Vladi here. Oh. oh. Come on. Wow. Was that Jamal McGlore, Big Cat, who got caught there? Yep. Uh, and P.J. Brown. There you go. 1994. He climbs Mount Matumbo. Yeah, there's no finger wag after that. No. That's just a different type of tenacity. That's, that's, oh, that's young C. Webb right there, too. Washington. 2001, he goes baseline and puts it behind Jake Sakalitas' back. That was a playoff game right there. That's wild. Doug Christie, the recipient there. Oh, oh my that's goodness. mean. <laughs> that's... Oh, 1993 is up next. Rookie year. Behind the back. And packs it on Charles. Take that, oh. Chuck. Take and by that. the way, take that cameraman with Chuck's booty. 
The behind the back is so unnecessary, right? He didn't no, need to no, do it. No, it, it was very necessary. <laughs> Just because I can. <laughs> Charles is out there watching going, man, why'd y'all do that to me? All right, now joining us <laughs> to discuss Chris Weber in detail is Myron Metcalf, our ESPN college basketball reporter, who recently sat down with Chris Weber one-on-one. So, Myron, when you spoke to Chris, what sense did you get about how much this Hall of Fame induction means to him? I think it means a lot. I mean, I think he was waiting eight years. It was a long wait, and he was sort of waiting for that validation. But I also get the sense that he's just doing so many amazing things in his life. He's just at peace, raising his family, his four-year-old twins. But I think this is certainly a, a cherry on the top of the Sunday for him, finally proving that, hey, he belongs in that crowd. Now, a huge part of Chris Webber's story will always be his stamp on the college game as a member of the Fab Five with Michigan. For our younger viewers who probably didn't see that unless they're watching it on YouTube, what was the significance of that group on the culture of basketball? I mean, the Fab Five, they were the first reality stars. They were the first rock stars. Uh, I mean, they would have gone viral today for sure if we had had social media back then. I know myself and a lot of other people like me got their first fade because of the Fab Five. So <laughs> they brought college basketball to a lot of us around the country and made us real fans. Even if you didn't love Michigan, even if you didn't care about the Big Ten, you saw those guys and you said, hey, I want to follow what they're doing. Yeah. So they had an Im incredible impact on the culture. No question about it. Just for, from top to bottom, really. I don't think there's any doubt about that. All right, much has been made about the rift between Weber and some of his other teammates with the Fab Five. Did Chris indicate to you that maybe they were working through some of those things? Yeah, he did. I mean, they're all brothers. You know, the Fab Five, those guys still keep in touch. It just sounds like Chris and Jalen have to have a, a private conversation. He said, listen, I've got a bunch of brothers and sisters, and this is what happens sometimes when you love someone. So they still love each other very much, but Chris just needs Jalen to kind of go into a room. They can settle their differences, and then hopefully we can get that public Fab Five reunion that we all deserve and that we all want to see. Yeah, hopefully that will be the case for sure. I mean, listen, it happens on our show all the time between Richard and Perk, so we deal with it. We get it. Trust me. All right.